This is Dr. Bob Greenberg, and this is The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John and Pete. If there are two guys from Jersey that need to meet, <laughs> it's you and Jay Moore. You need to do Jay Moore's show. JJ, you need to have Seriously, Bob Greenberg dude. on your show. You will love it, and your guys will love it as well. Jersey dudes, man. Jersey Both dudes. Hard asses. We're at Dr. Bob's house. I'm going to start this thing off officially because what happens with us is we've been here. Who knows how long we've been here? We've been here a while. We're drinking martinis. We just launch in. I hit the record button at some point, and we were just mid-conversation. So we don't have a real natural start to this show, and I think that that's organically beautiful. Yeah. And I will say that the second most favorite thing about Dr. Bob, the thing that I love second most is these damn lovely martinis, yeah. man. <laughs> you martinis have a way with a martini. I tended bar. I was a bartender. And and I make a pretty good martini. But you know what? There's just some times when, as you said, you let the house decide and you go for the ride. Mm -hmm. And one of those times is uh, when you make it to Dr. Bob's and he's making martinis. I don't care what kind of bar chops you have. <laughs> In fact, the the more bar chops you have, yeah, this is, you and, and it's just true with any discipline. The more bar chops you have, the more you sit back and go, okay. But I'm a one horse wonder. You know, this is what I do. Yeah. I, I'll make a Cosmo for my wife because I have to. Right, right. Right. But this is what I do. This is what I focused my entire life essence on. If you're a bartender, you have to be able to do a million different things yeah. aside from deal with your customers, all of whom want to tell you their life story and or pick you up. Right. But all I have to do is mix martinis. So it's easy. I've, I've perfected the art as best as I can. Mm -hmm. And now, fine. The other thing is, John, it always tastes better when someone else does it. That's true. This is something I have found out. Okay. Yeah. But if we came here to ask you for a rusty nail, I bet it would look just like this drink. Here. You'd be like, here's a rusty nail. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, I make my rusty nails with gin, vermouth, and an olive. Right? How do you like that? <laughs> <Yeah. Right. laughs> Call it what you will. Yes. Yeah. So we're back in the uh, lovely home of Dr. Bob Greenberg. And thanks for having us back. My pleasure. Thank you for wanting to come back. Yeah. You know what? Pete and I have to have this debate. We go, hey, is it time to call Dr. Bob yet? No, 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 no. Come on. We're going to wear out our welcome. No, it's time. No, come on. We're going to wear out our welcome. And then we trade roles. Hey, man, I think you should call Dr. Bob. No, no, no. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> We're waiting. We're waiting. So if we have our druthers, uh, we would see you much more frequently than we do. We have learned so much from you. Our audience has learned so much from you. And you even contributed to our 100th show with Sly Stone and had one of the best stories on there. I mean, the feedback that we're getting from this show, a lot of people just love that story because they can relate to it. Yeah. Other people had stories that were a little more hearing about Sly, feeling how he felt when they made music, being inspired to make music. So many more people just understood Sly from the standpoint of, I saw him once, and he right. was amazing. Right. And when I left that place, I couldn't, I couldn't find my way home. <laughs> yeah, what we came to realize with that show, and, and I think we captured it, was you talk about the influence of somebody that's bigger than the genre. You know, he becomes foundational. So if you're going to be in a genre now, like, he's part of the foundation of your music. But it's also he made it okay for people to have multi genders, multi races in a, in a group, more than one person can sing. And then that cascades down to all these other groups. Like I was talking about bull moose, right. you know, it's this young, young group just getting started, but they got a female singer to lead and they've got different people, a black color. drummer, yeah. and a white bass player and a, and everybody's working together and every, and it's nobody's thinking anything. Right. So you've got this, just purely you know, this, making music, asking you guys, do they understand in terms of this brief but rich history of rock and roll, and, and do they understand where they're coming from, or do they just take this for granted now as as part of the baggage that goes with the with the genre? Well, it's probably the latter. It's probably the latter because they're kids, and but, it takes time to get there too. But right? I, yeah, I yeah. think I think you're right. They'll get there. I think they have the mentality that says, "I'm going to have a good time doing this." That is some at some point going to turn into. Oh, I understand what it is I'm the torchbearer of now. Because, you know, I always find this interesting with rockers. Uh, as having been one once when I was a teenager, or at least thought I was one, at least I had the clothes, is that um, 
Because it's an oral tradition, yeah. folks tend not to look into the past the way they might. The yeah. way they might. You know, jazzers do know the past. They have mm. to know the past right, because right. because it's an art form that demands that you build on a very – well, let's just say that there's no top 40 jazz. You can't, right. you can't access jazz the way you can access rock and roll. Yeah. Right. Rock and roll is everywhere. Yep. You just have to jazz, open your you've ears. Go all in. Jazz, you have to search for it. You have to look for it. And in looking for it, you kind of learn the history yeah, as you educate. go. Sure. But since rock is our basic environmental music now and has been so since the 50s, right. you can just sit there, hear stuff, and then start doing your own version of what you heard without yeah. really knowing – where the social from. history, the musical history, where it came from, and that with rock, sociology and music are one and the same. Oh yeah, uh, it's, you can't you can't take the music out of the race relations part. You right. can't take the music out of the uh, the politics right. of yep. the last fifty years. It was the music of rebellion. It was the music of expression of youth. It's the, it was the music of, of sexual reawakening um, or awakening, which is one reason why Elvis was so disliked by so many white people, yeah. because he was bringing this black sexual ethos into the white community, mm. and that was impermissible. That was not okay. But it's one of the things I love about Elvis. It's one of the things I – the comments I love, because if you look at the, the – um, the profusion of ragtime at the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. Same bitching yes. and moaning by the same white community. Yeah. You're bringing the ethos of Africa via black America into the white community and ruining our children. It's the same thing that you heard when rap really exploded out on the yeah. scene in the 70s and 80s. You're bringing this poetry of the angry black community into our innocent white community. It's all a pile of crap, obviously. And thank God we're moving through it if not past it. But the comments are the same. And if you're a rocker, I think, you know, you want to know that history. Mm. You want to know what you're part of. And it's something that, yes, you have to come to in time. I so appreciate hearing this stuff from you because you have, uh, you have a, you've studied the influence of music on history and vice versa. Right. And when we're going to talk about that, we're going to talk about your new series. But to relate it to rock and roll the way that you have, you have a perspective that really not not many other people, because of the fact that when you are a rocker, that is a young man's game, and you get into or a that, young woman's game, and, yes. or a young woman's game, and you get into that role, even if you're a leader in that role. Let's say you're Robert Plant. Mm. You're in the you're the guy, and you're not busy trying to learn the history or your impact or your Let's say you're George Clinton. You are just purely expressing yourself. And it really takes somebody who is not only uh, someone who knows of music but knows of history to understand what that is about. And if we're lucky, we get a little taste and we have our eyes and ears open to the perspective of somebody who can say, listen, this is what's happening to you right now. Yeah. And this is what we're getting. Yeah. And you hold these kind of threads. We asked you off mic a question about the song Man Eater and one note that just lives for two and a half minutes. That we've made fun song. of in at least five episodes. Yeah, <laughs> but it's incredible. And I knew that you would have threads that I couldn't account for. And you immediately went back 150 years to Wagner. And, and then you can go, I'm sure you can go back further and oh, further. I went back to Bach. You went back to yeah, Bach. The yeah, the F major Bach. Toccata. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. This and, idea. And then forward to Philip Glass. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, Steve Reich. Steve, Steve Reich. Reich and Terry Riley. But Philip Glass, yes. I mean, listen, sustaining a single pitch against constantly changing musical materials yeah. has been a device that's been used for hundreds of years. It gives underpinning and also creates friction. You know, if you mm. hold one object still and you rub another object on top of it, it it, it necessarily creates yeah. friction because the objects don't line up with each other. They're mm -hmm. not necessarily in simpatico with each other. So if Hall and Oath is going to sustain a pitch for forever and ever, whether it's done accidentally, which is how most music happens, by the way, yeah, accidentally, sure. someone has an idea and says, ooh, let's try that and see if it works. Or if it's done on purpose, it makes no difference. In fact, purposeful and accident are the same thing when it comes to creating music, when mm -hmm. it comes to creating anything. Eureka, I found it. What, yeah. a, what an accident. This is how things happen. Yeah, Bono talks about how there you just wait for God to enter the room. Yeah. And he's going to show up when he shows up. That's what inspiration is. You inspiration to be in the room is, working. A, yeah. is a momentary revelation that you had no right having, that sometimes doesn't happen. Right. 
you know, half of the work, in fact, 90% of the work, it's the old sweat versus inspiration. 90% of the work is realizing you just had a good idea and figuring out what to do with it yeah. once you've had it. Yeah. The fascinating thing about rock and roll and to a, to a certain degree jazz as well is that it's a communal creation. I mean, you could have a McCartney and Lennon writing a song, but ultimately the group has to get together and the piece is created communally in conversation. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. I mean, recording sessions become creation sessions, composition sessions, whereas in the <clears throat> the traditional compositional world, you know, everything's done beforehand. Yeah. And a recording session is, is just a matter of documenting something that was created weeks, months, the years before. The genius that was created before. at the piano with the pen and pad. Right. But rock and roll is a, is a, is a conversational mm -hmm. art form right. and is created. The actual performance, the yeah. actual sound of a piece is only as good as the individual members of a group and how they meld to create the larger whole. Right. So I'm not surprised when you tell me that, that he stuck his finger down <laughs> yeah. and just left it there. Yeah. And it turns out to be this, this small miracle. Yeah. Now that small miracle though is something that Pete and I have had an evolved imagination about because it started off, he called me one morning. I think he called me about 6.30 in the morning and was like, hey, have you ever noticed this this note at the end of Maneater? And I said, what? <laughs> what, <laughs> what are you listening to? And I'm listening to Maneater, man. Check this out. This note. You got to check out this note. And he didn't have it. Didn't That was as much a description as I got. And then we had stuff to do, and I got to it a few hours later, and I, I put it on, and I went, there it is. Yeah, you can't miss it. There it is. And, and then wait. Now I dare it to keep going. And I listened to the last two thirds of the song and it's there and it may drift off at some point or whatever at the second half of the refrain. It doesn't, but you're right. It doesn't. And, and the thing is now it's gone from, wow, it's amazing that that note could stick in there to, oh no, yeah. no, he did that on purpose to, oh no, he found that note and then he lived on it and he looked at everybody else while it was going on. Like you said, the conversation was happening and he was the guy. It was like the guy in the, corner of the room doing something you know inappropriate and mischievous and he keeps doing it and everybody else is talking and they don't notice and he's looking at the one guy on the other side of the room that notices he's over there doing that you know he might be rubbing his groin on the statue or whatever and then, hey look he's a and sh don't say anything don't say anything i'm over here doing this and the guy on the other end of the room and it's a joke between two people yeah. while the rest of the band is playing their arrangement you know, we were, we were talking about this. It's called a pedal tone when, when a single pitch mm -hmm. yeah. is sustained or repeated for a long time. We were talking about this before we went on. I mentioned that the, uh, that the overture to, to Wagner's music from uh, Das Rheingold starts on an E flat and sustains that E flat for X number of minutes. That's it. And I mentioned how the pitch C is repeated over and over and over again for the complete duration of the piece of music by Terry Riley that is properly called in C. There's a funny story that goes with uh, Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. It's a piece of music he wrote in 1912. It's a ballet that depicts supposedly Bronze Age mating rituals in the steppes of Russia. So he had to create a music that somehow was both modern but didn't evoke anything that anyone would recognize because this is supposed to be the Bronze Age. And there's one passage called The Dance of the Adolescence where he created this chord, and I'm going to play it at the piano behind us in a moment. I'm sure the mics will pick it up, where this chord is repeated throbbingly, very sexually, with these uneven accents about 250 times. Wow. <laughs> in fact, let me play that chord. It's, a, it's an E-flat dominant seven chord over an E major chord. And while Bo Dr. Bob is walking to the piano, I will say that we're going to enjoy listening to this thing. That was painful. You cannot ignore that. <laughs> you can't ignore it. That's fantastic. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, when Stravinsky played this at the piano for Sergei Diaghilev, who was the producer of the ballet and the, the CEO of the Ballet Russe, the Russian ballet that was creating this thing, um, Diaghilev looked at him like he was crazy. Good looked, God, looked that's at hideous. Stravinsky like he was crazy, and apparently asked him, "And how long does this chord go on for?" And Stravinsky's famous response was, "Till the very end, my dear." <laughs> <laughs> 
So that's like your guy with the statue during right. the recording it's session. You know, it. how long yeah. till the end, my dear? <laughs> I picture yeah. someone in the, in the back in the produce, producer's yeah. office, you know, back in that little segment, and they're, they're doing the tapes and they're winding it back. And like Daryl Hall puts his change purse on one note and he's like talking. He's not paying attention. And they're like, genius. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Back when people carried a change right. purse. Daryl Hall carried a change purse. You know, the little squeezy green one with the rubber and, and, That's and right. like, the Jesus fish on yeah, the back of it. Yeah, that opened in the, in uh-huh. the center, uh, yeah. opened up like an eye. Oh, Alexander Graham Bell spilling the acid and saying, yes. come here, I need you. Right. Yep. And accidentally realizing that it only worked. at that moment did his telephone work. Yes. Right. Is that what happened? Or Archimedes getting in his bathtub mm-hmm. and seeing the water rise, yeah. and, re- and and he says, "Eureka! I've got it!" Yeah. Realizing that that if you put a body in water, that that mass displaces, displaces volume. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> genius, gene. Well, yeah. yeah, if you're prepared, if you're prepared to, to recognize it, what just happened, yeah. if you're in the lab and you're prepared, willing to see it, vulcanization. Right, accident. perfect. And perfect I'm going to go example. back to the sentence that Pete uh, uttered that I think we may all have missed, except that he said that you have to be in there doing the work. Right. Mm-hmm. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete Turner. And if you like the show... Do us a favor. Yeah, share it. That's the biggest thing, honestly. All your social media outlets, all your friends, let them know the ones that you like. Yeah. I mean, we make this show for you guys. If you think it's great... Say so. Say so by sharing it. Say so by putting a comment in after the show. Also, if you go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts, give us a rating. Give us a review. If you think the show is great, please give us five stars and say so. And if you think the show really sucks, please give us five stars and say so. Because, <laughs> but heck, we're listening. That's right. You can't be more approachable than us. We, we want to make the show better. If there's something that we're missing, let us know. Yeah, that really is how you help us. That's right. Tell us all about it. Thanks for listening. And now back to the show. As long as you're in there doing the work, then you open yourself up to the perception right. of that moment of genius. Right. Holy shit. I think we're done here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Time to go home and experiment yeah, on something. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about your new series. Uh, I'm really pleased with my new series. I think it's the best thing I've ever done. Wow. Jesus. Yeah, no, I do. I do. It, it's, um, this was for the great courses. It's a 24 lecture series, 45 minutes each lecture. And the challenge was, uh, you know, most of all of my courses up to now have been about music, about the musical literature. Sadly, I've not been able to do a jazz course or a rock course, much as I'd love to because the licensing issues are being able to license the music mm. I would need to play and talk about, I, it would just be so prohibitively expensive as to be beyond the pale. Yeah. So I have to basically work with composers that have been dead for more than 75 years. And right. that way we have to pay for the performance, this orchestra or right. that orchestra, but we don't have to pay the estate of the composer. Right. And uh, that's another conversation that we could have today if you want to hear a lot of anger and ugliness <laughs> come out of my mouth, which you might actually. Well, I do want to talk, though, very briefly about how much we want to see artists earn their due. But at the same time, the syndrome that you speak of really holds back quite a lot. Listen, I'm a living composer. I know sometimes I sound like Snake Plissken from, you know, Escape from New York. And the, you say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, no, I'm a, I'm a composer. We, I thought all composers were dead. I mean, if you, if you watch Escape from New York, every time Snake Plissken, we thought you were dead. Well, no, we're not all dead. And it would nice, would be nice to be rewarded for what I do, but okay. While I'm, you're living. Yeah. You know, and when I die, throw all the music on the funeral pyre with me because I couldn't care less. Having said that, it's absurd. If I want to use, let's say, the music of Bella Bartok, this brilliant, genius Hungarian composer who died in 1945. If I want to use his music in one of my courses, I can't. Because he's not dead 75 years yet, right. and his publisher, Boozy and Hawks, which is in London, and his family's estate, forbids me from being able to use his music. So, if I want to do a lecture about a piece by Bartok, I can't. Who does that 
benefit. Bartok's loss, I say. Yeah. Everybody's loss. Yeah. You know, Bartok's already dead, so I don't think he cares. Right. But I care because his music humanizes us. His music unites us. It's a very um, synthetic music in that it brings together his Hungarian roots, mm. his, his musical modernism. But he was a pan-nationalist. He studied a lot of music, and it all finds its way into what he does. So it's so cool, and it's so exciting. We shouldn't have to deny ourselves the joy, the pleasure, and the, uh, the revelation that Bartok's music brings. But the lawyers who guard the gates mm -hmm. will not allow me to use his music. So it does no one any good. I promise you it betrays what he intended of it. No, I, of that, you are 100% yeah. correct. I can't use Charles Ives' music, the great American composer who died in 51. In fact... I did a lecture on Ives. Uh, I did a lecture on his New England symphony called Three Places in New England for a course I did called Orchestral Masterworks. Mm -hmm. And a year after that course came out, his publisher, Theodore Presser, came back to us and said, we want to redo the contract, the licensing contract. You're not paying us enough money. And they tried to basically squeeze more money out of the great courses, a lot more money. And it got to the point where we had to withdraw that lecture from the course. I had to come back, deliver an additional lecture now on a French composer named Camille Sassons, his third symphony. And that replaced the Ives in this course. So if you bought one of the first versions of this course, right. you got the Ives. If you didn't, you've got the Sassons. Ives never took a penny for his music in his own lifetime. Refused royalties because he said all music is for all people. Wow. Music belongs to no one. Do you think he wouldn't be sickened, nauseous yeah. by the greed of this publisher? There are no Ives uh, survivors left. He didn't have any kids. Right. Uh, so, so this is all legal entities yeah, that, right. that are trying to suck the life's blood out of this music. Well, the other thing is, is one of the things you've been put on this earth to do is to open up the, I don't know who any of these people are, you know, right. I can tell you that there's a guy named Puccini and, and yeah, that's about it, right. you know, until you open that up and, and do what you do. I don't have those, that knowledge right. in my head. I don't have that beauty. And I would be moved to buy the person I've bought books. You, uh, the, the book about Mozart, I bought that book, read it cover to right. cover, and that made me buy other books and other music that I never, ever would have bought. It's almost like a badass, yeah. awesome infomercial. And that's the thing is the lawyers don't understand that. So, for example, I would love, because I started life as a rock and roller, but then I went into jazz, and it was as a jazz piano player that I got into music. And I was working as a jazzer in New York, and it was a hard, nasty, yucky life. I determined early on to go to grad school and be a composer, and that's what I did. You didn't embrace the filth. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. <laughs> that's beautiful, I also dude. I to say before anything <laughs> else happens that we missed out on Ives, and now we've got Sassons, who's the Scott Brocious of <laughs> French composers. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. You know, I like, I, as, and you could have had the Carney Lansford. And we could have had the Carney Lansford. You could have had the Carney yeah. Lansford, you know? You could have had a guy, a guy who was down in the trenches yeah. doing the dirty all the time. Way to bring that home. Yeah. All twitchy, nervous, and doing it. Uh -huh. And doing it yeah. all the time. And no, and mess with Carney. Yeah. You're going to get hit. You know Absolutely. what I mean? Yes. <laughs> so there you have it. No, you know, it's, um, it really So you is, weren't built for the grime. Uh, and thank God. Yeah. No, I wasn't built for the grime. And, and I saw it at an age when it affected me very negatively. Yeah. And I was working with really good people, too. Yeah. I wasn't working with grimy people. I yeah. mean, I was working with a sax player named Lee Konitz, who was my teacher at the time and who was using me as his pianist briefly but wonderfully. And Lee is still alive. Lee would be in his late 80s now. And this is an amazing player. This is a guy who played with Charlie Parker, a sax player. Wow. Um, a guy who studied with Lenny Tristano, who was my favorite piano player. And anyway, back, back to the point is that I'd love to do a course on jazz, but I can't. Yeah. Can't touch can't. it. Can't touch it. It's too new. Can't, it's too expensive. Yeah. You know, if, if you're talking about, if you're doing jazz and I want to talk about Charlie Parker, it's not just that I have to use Charlie Parker's music. Yeah. I have to use that recording of Cherokee. Yeah. Mm. That yeah. what made for Savoy and whenever it was in sure. 1945, that solo, that if I'm talking about John Coltrane 
I've got to have giant steps from that Atlantic album yeah. made in the early 60s. I've got to have that specific recording. And all of these labels, all of these recordings are now owned by multinationals, by bigs, right. whether it's Warner or Electro or whatever, yeah. Sony, exactly. And they are just going to bleed you dry. You know, we're talking about thousands, thousands and thousands of dollars per minute. And it just can't be done. So it's sad. But uh, the jazz and rock and roll courses will have to wait for 150 years until someone can afford to do them. Yeah. But anyway, back to your question about the current course. Music is a mirror of history. My courses in the past have been about music, and then I use history to contextualize that music. Right. This course is flipped over on its head. I'm talking about history and using music as a descriptor for that history. So each lecture is about a historical event and then a specific piece of music that was written in response mm. to that historical event. And the beauty of it, as I discovered as I wrote the course, was that, you know, when we read history books, history books are about dead emperors and dead kings and about wars. Right. That's a huge percentage of what history is about. History is about the upper end events and right. the upper end people. Well, let's give some context to our listeners. That would be like if you wrote a history book about the 90s, and it was about the first Gulf War. Right. And it completely missed Nirvana and Alanis Morissette. And, and more than that, if it's about the first Gulf War, what are the impacts yeah. on the community right. here in Kuwait? In, um, in Iraq, what are the impacts among the people? How is the war perceived? And that's where the music comes in. Right. Because the music becomes a voice for the emotions, the mindset, and the perceptions of a much larger population. And that's what the music can give us that, that plain history writing can't. It can give us a sense of a, of a reaction, hmm. of a societal feel for that event. And right. that's the beauty of talking about, let's say, a piece of music by Beethoven that's written in response to Napoleon. We're not talking about Napoleon now. We're talking about Beethoven's take on Napoleon and through Beethoven, his culture's take on those events. Yes, yes, yes. His culture's take on those events because what we had in the Gulf War was captured by CNN and forced down our throats. Right. And, you know, we were there to consume it. But what we missed out on was the fact that that really created the, it, as a response, the birth of Algerian hip-hop. And what went on in Los Angeles in the early 90s also went on in Morocco, Algeria, and those sentiments bled over into Arab populations and they had something to say and they had something to say in a form of music that we didn't get in a lot of other places in the world but they were just as angry just as expressive and some would say maybe a little more artistic nothing is separable from anything else yeah. this is John this is you know you know my stuff and this is my shtick is that everything has context and we cannot separate any human activity out from any other human activity. Right. There and is a circumstance. Correct. There is a holistic context that if we can try to understand, because we can't fully understand anything, sure. we can spend our lives trying. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. That is a wonderful pursuit. It's a beautiful that's thing. That's what we're doing here. Yes. With the understanding that, that as the old line goes, history is perceived memory and memory is flawed. Mm -hmm. Memory is based on the workings of the individual mind, its own prejudices, its own preconceptions, you know, what's better for me to remember? I mean, during this political campaign, are oh, we man. not seeing this? May reality has become so skewed, depending on who you are, that it's hard to believe we're all on the same page, living at the same moment in history. Yeah. So history itself and what we perceive as facts are quite malleable, quite variable. But one of the things we can do through the art of a period is perceive a larger emotional or expressive reality, right. one that allows us at least to try to, to come to grips, to, to maybe understand 
how people were comprehending their environment at the time. That's what this course is all about. Yes. Let me see if I'm grabbing what you're saying so I can better understand it. Because I hear you, but I just want to make sure I'm, I'm tracking it. So you're saying... Got to buy it, dude. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> I absolutely intend okay. to buy it. I mean, because what you... I will say this, and I don't get paid by Dr. Bob to say this. I love what you do. I have spent money on things in the past. I will continue to do that. You keep making things. You have I no idea on. your impact on Pete. Yeah, Thank you. It's massive. Thank you. Um, so historical event happens, 1985, 1785, whenever it is. And that turns into an artist sort of translating that either consciously or subconsciously. If I read that, the panic of 1893, there's no, it doesn't evoke anything. But if I can take Scott Joplin representing that musically, now there's, because you've, you've taught me this, musicians think about what is the thing that I need to create. This is where the bassoon needs to come in because the bassoon in this way is going to unsettle the audience. And then the flute is going to play with that unsettling. And, and so they use music in terms of emotion. This is the response I want as opposed to here are the facts, you know, written by somebody who may or may not, have the perspective to even have all the facts, right? So you've got Scott Joplin translating the facts for me in a way that's going to draw out emotion, which to me is contextual, emotional, and then now it's in my brain. So I'm thinking about it. I think it's wonderful. Well, you mentioned the Panic of 1893. Right. Amazing. One of the pieces I do in this course is uh, a very well-known piece by Antonin Dvorak, or Anton Dvorak, as he's didn't want to be known. Anton is the German equivalent, <laughs> Anton in the Czech, and he was a Czech, even though Germans still controlled his country. Uh, the New World Symphony, his right. Symphony Number no. 9, which he wrote while he was living in New York in 1893. Huh. And he was brought to the United States during all the fuss uh, of the of the four, the 300th anniversary, 300th, blah, 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 the 500th anniversary. No, excuse me. I'm drinking a martini and my numbers are, <laughs> it was the 400th anniversary okay. of Columbus's so-called discovery of the United States, which was celebrated in the, or America, in the Americas, which was celebrated between 1892 and 1893, right? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean mm -hmm. blue, blah, blah, blah. Right. And, and so that lecture talks about the post-Civil War birth of this concept of American exceptionalism. Mm. And this, this, this orgy of jingoism that took place in 1892 and 1893 that led to the financial collapse of 1893, the panic of 1893, because everyone was going crazy. Oh, America this, America that. And Dvorak's presence in the United States was mm. all part of that orgy of American exceptionalism. We're going to bring in this hot ringer from, from Prague yeah. to kickstart an American school of composition because that's the only thing we lack now. Mm -hmm. We're inventing everything. <laughs> we're building everything. Our, our GDP is bigger than everybody. We're the greatest. We're the best. The only thing we haven't done yet is create an indigenous music. Right. So we're going to bring this Czech dude in. And he's going to show us how to do it. So again... Here's a piece of music that exemplifies the folly and the beauty of American exceptionalism as it existed in 1892 and 93 and the inevitable collapse right. that led to it. Because you can't indulge yourself like that and not be hung over the next morning. Right. And that's what happened. That is beautiful. I got lucky with the 1893. Yeah, team. no shit. Dude. Boy, that's a nice tool that was, right there. That was hot, man. That was wow. hot. Wow. That was like an accidental alley-oop. <laughs> I will say this. No, I that that's have, that's the note on the Hall of Notes that song, is, that man. Is exactly that is just, that. you know. And I think that when we talk about these kinds of things, two things come to mind for me that are absolutely just left field asides. First, that I used to work for this guy named John Decker, who was a fascinating dude and a really wonderful human being. He was the president of a financial services company that I uh, worked at for a number of years. And he was uh, more of a mentor to me than he probably realizes, but he had a piece of his thumb that was missing and it was conspicuous to everyone else, but he just went on about his day and you could tell that we were a company led by uh, a guy who was very fiscally conservative and all these things and, uh, you know, calculated and all that stuff. But uh, that, missing part of his thumb made you understand that he was an adventurer and 
one day I had the guts, I suppose, or stupidity to just say, can I just ask you what happened to your thumb? <laughs> and he said, you know, uh, it was 1992, and uh, my son and I decided that we were going to get in a sailboat uh, in Spain, and we were going to retrace the uh, voyage of Columbus to wow. celebrate its 500th anniversary. And they were in like a 38 foot sailboat or some <laughs> damn thing. And uh, before they had left the port in Spain, there was an accident and two of the boats the boat that they were moored right next to slammed into the other Ouch. one while he was reaching for something and clipped off the corner of his thumb. And his son went, holy shit, and dove into the water to look for it. Hot dogs. Yeah. And in the middle of it, they never found it, but they took him to the hospital. He wrapped it up and stuff, and they were deciding whether or not to go on the voyage. And he was like, yeah, I don't know. You know, and he was kind of feeling self-conscious about it. Then a friend of his who they were going on the voyage, this is this is kind of what I imagine Pete would do. He uh, was a fisherman, and he took him to this bar in Spain that was populated with all these fishermen. And he yeah, how many stood fingers up. were missing? He, exactly. point, he stood exactly. up at some point and said, hey, everybody, this is what happened. And this is my friend. And he was sitting there, you know, kind of <laughs> holding his, yeah, self-conscious, holding right. his thumb. And he went, show it to everybody, man. And so he, you know, hesitantly lifted up his and a raucous applause. Right. And then everybody held up their missing appendage. <laughs> like a Mac, he ended up going on the voyage with his thumb wrapped up and they finished it. Right. And these are the kinds of things that if we can capture the musical equivalent of someone who says that this circumstance in history will be answered by me in this fashion, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this instead of acquiesce to history. These are the things. Or acquiesce to circumstances, to as circumstance the case may be. Circumstances in history. Right. Yes, absolutely. That's what I meant. Uh, thank you for the, the, the correction. The, this is what propels humanity. And so in capturing these things, I think this is probably what has uh, created such enchantment in Pete about you, because I, I don't mean to embarrass you right now, but I will. I think that the seminal figures in Pete's musical consciousness, uh, if I may be so bold as to as to speculate, are Bono and you. Bono. Damn. You guys speak to me. Yeah. You do. Damn. Yeah. I mean, I think that when I we talk about things, I mean, I can talk about the greasiest, funkiest get down on the get down, something from deep down funky Detroit or, you know, something that was. And Pete will somehow tie it back to either Bono or something he heard in a lecture that spoke to him that you laid out that said, hey, history behaves this way and music reacts like this. Well, you know, and I'm really flattered because I, I, I'm blushing and I, I don't think I've blushed since like the early seventies. <laughs> and it was because <laughs> of, a, 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 and that would have been, that would have been a girl, you know, so. <laughs> well, but, I am good looking. <laughs> but your and, daughter and, is, and so you, it's fine. Big titties. Yeah. <laughs> oh, stop it, you boys. <laughs> but see, Bono, you want to talk about someone who knows his history, yeah. someone who's got the intellect to stand behind the artistic impulse. And that's one reason why he's so respected in the community is because that's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, you know, I never really thought about it that way, but that's true. I think that and someone who takes his responsibilities as a celebrity seriously. very seriously yeah. and does a lot of freaking good for and the world manages not to take himself so too seriously, seriously no, while he's doing true. it because yeah. You know, I had never thought of it that way, but the musical community does, in every genre, respect from Bono the fact that he understands that, listen, we're committing these things to posterity, and we have an obligation to the rest of us. Important, not necessarily now and not with an agenda today, but that is going to be important 20, 50, 100 years from now to have captured. And he knows his history. Yeah. yeah. He knows not just his musical history. He knows his own personal history. He knows his Irish history. He knows who he is. He knows what he comes from. Um, he makes the right decisions. Yeah. In my mind, to my mind. 
And uh, so thank you. I'm getting goosebumps <laughs> just having been grouped with him. Well, and if I may take another aside. Uh-oh. Here we go. Uh, I'm just right. going to say, You're God damn leaders. it, that yeah. olive and that last bit of that martini was so <laughs> damn good. I'm going to spend a good portion of the rest of my life chasing that mixture of decadence and savory in every bite of food. Because that folks I eat. don't know what we've just been experiencing. Mm-hmm. I would say that I, I order these olives online. I make it chipped to me by the bottles by the dozen from a company, and they deserve to be celebrated. The Santa Barbara Olive Company. Not a sponsor. Not not a sponsor. sponsor, A family-owned company in Santa Barbara, California, that makes these miraculous things. And these olives are stuffed with chipotle. Very spicy. You pop a couple of these olives into your martini, and by the time you get to the bottom, Mm. the martini has been informed Uh by the olive. In fact, the martini has taken on the character of that chipotle. And that is what my friend John is so correctly celebrating at this moment in time. Let me tell you, the the informed nature of that martini was the way that I was informed when I was 19 years old by a woman I will never forget who was 31. Uh-oh. Oh, my God. If only I <laughs> had had such an... And never mind. <laughs> anyway. Now, that's a great course. Yes. That's, what, <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened to that martini. God bless you wherever so, you are. Um,